Siwakoatu, The Serpent Woman, one of the two highest positions of government among various Nahua cultures. Several years ago, a novel titled Tlaca Elo, The Aztec Among the Aztecs by Antonio Velasco Piña was published. Thanks to this novel, many heard the word Siwakoatu as Tlaca Elo. The protagonist held the position of Siwakoatu. But what do we know about this title and its use in the government of many cultures? Pre-Hispanic government structures cannot be compared to those of, of other continents, as they were different in many aspects. The concept of Siwakoatl was one of many forms of governance. Now, what most people know about the pre-Hispanic past of present-day Mexico is obviously related to the Mexicas, commonly mislabeled as Aztecs. In documentaries, historical series, and even animated shows, they all talk about or mention the maximum Mexica authority, often incorrectly calling them the king or Aztec emperor, appearing as the sole ruler of Tenochtitlan. Obviously, this belief is mistaken, as there were neither kings nor emperors here, since these are European concepts. But now is the time to clarify and demystify many things about Siwakotl and their counterpart in government. Starting with the fact that the real names of figures like Moctezuma Sokoyotzin, Huitlahuac and Cuauhtémoc were Wei Tlatuani, where Wei is Nahuatl means great and Tlatuani means a spokes person. Therefore, Wei Tlatuani translates to great the spokes person. This was not a solitary figure of power. Alongside them was the Siwakoatl. Siwakoatl is divided into Siwa, the Nahua word for woman, and Coatl, which means serpent, thus meaning serpent woman. So, the maximum Mexica power resided in these two figures, the Huaytlatuani and the Siwakoatl. They cannot be compared to something like a president and vice president. These positions were not created by the Mexicas. Well, we have records that mention the existence of these dual positions, as in history of the Mexicans through their paintings, where in a town called Tochimilco it is stated. After these two lords died, Two others succeed in the lordship, named Kakamatsin and Siwakwatsin. There are also records of dualities in governance in Texcoco, Tepoztlan and other places, although their functions and operations are not clear. This demonstrates that this power organization was highly concentrated in central Mexico. However, this power structure was not unique to the Mexicas. Contrary to today's divided government and religion, in those times it was different. The concepts of Huitlatani and Siwakoatl appeal to the worldview of their past. In certain events and ceremonies, these rulers seem to embody the divinities, embodying the concept of duality prevalent in their societies. This idea of duality extended to various aspects to their societies starting with Ometeotl, the dual essence of energy that created everything according to Nahua myths. They believe in duality in day and night, light and darkness, life and death, etc. This concept of duality was crystallized in their form of government, embodying both masculine and feminine aspects. The Tlatuani represented the masculine, while the Siwakoatl represented the feminine. Why were these values assigned to the two positions? 
to understand this, we must turn to the divinity from which the name Sihuacoatl was derived, none other than Mother Earth, or planet, known by other names such as Tonantzin and Coatlicue. Earth is naturally associated with the feminine, with the power to give life to plants and animals. Hence, the Tlatani was linked to the father, symbolized as a grey agüewete, tree whose shade covered the entire community, while the Sihuacoatl was seen as the nurturing and consoling mother. The worship of Sihuacoatl predates the creation of this government position, as it was first a deity and later a political role. However, it is unclear when exactly this dual governance structure originated, with Lacaele being a key figure governing, alongside several Tratuanis among the Mexicas, but Onsententes exist before his time. Well, there are theories that suggest that at least among the Mexicas in their early days, this with their first Latuani Akamapistli, both positions could have been held by a single person. Examining the Codex Mendoza, which already shows Spanish influence, we see the first official Tatuani named Akamapistli, wearing the Turkios crown called Siwitzoli in Nahuatl, indicating that he held the position of wet Latuani. Above this crown, this is precisely an image of a woman's head, with a serpent's body. However, in another image of him on the same page, this image is no longer present, but instead, he has a warrior's hairstyle, leading to the theory that perhaps bow rollers were initially performed by one person and were later divided. The clear establishment of the Sihuacoatl position seems to have occurred after the Tecpanec War, where Iscoatl and Nezahualcoyot, along with several other towns, defeated Maxtla, freeing themselves from the dominance of Azcapotzalco. This is when the figure of Tlacaele emerged as the Sihuacoatl. Some speculate that this might be the moment when the position was instituted, at least among the Mexicas. Why, there were other Sihuacoatls after Tlacaele, he is considered the most renowned among them. It is even said that, upon the death of some of the Tlatuanis, he ruled alongside. Tlacaele was offered the position of Tlatuani, but he declined. Now, let's talk about their attire. Although, they likely had a variety of outfits, for different occasions, the typical attire for the Tlatuani included the use of turquoise blue and turquoise crown. On the other hand, the Sihuacoat is said to have worn white and black clothing, as there were the colors associated with the Sihuacoatl deity. However, there are also records suggesting that, being a duality, they were certain ceremonies where they dressed identically like twins. Here's a humorous note. It is said that in certain ceremonies the Sihuacoatl would dress as a woman, wearing a long skirt and whipil, which makes sense as the Sihuacoatl is the woman serpent, but it is also said that they wore an attire with eagle feathers that distinguished them from the Tlatuani. Now, let's talk about their functions. Many describe them as advisors to the Tlatuani, somewhat subordinate to them. However, there are records indicating that there were sometimes disagreements between the Tlatuani and the Sihuacoatl. If this is true, it demonstrates that the Sihuacoatl was not merely an advisor to the Tlatuani, and could even disagree with their decisions. Another aspect to highlight based on their worldview is that the Tlatuani was more associated with the sun, war, and daytime. While the Sihuacoatl dealt with more religious matters, the moon and darkness, they fulfilled functions now called shamanic, 
serving as the guardian of the history of their community. Remembering the Legend of the Sons, where the duality of Nanawatsin became the sun and Tekusisteka to the moon. This legend perhaps supported the creation of these two government positions. The Siwakotl is also linked to the administration of justice, acting as a kind of judge, but they also deal with more religious and spiritual matters. For example, when Moctezuma and Wicamina sent an expedition to search for the mythical Aztlan or where their ancestors departed, desiring to send warriors, the Siwakotl suggested that diviners and spiritual individuals were needed instead of warriors as it was not a conquest, but a reunion with the past. Another curious function is that, as a woman, they also had to provide comfort and even cry for others, as a woman good. There are records that when the Mexicas were defeated by the Purépechas, the Siwakos all had to cry as a grieving woman, and go to console the surviving warriors. Obviously, it was not something humiliating, as in their role as a woman, they sought to console and accompany with their tears the pain of defeat. They were also an authoritative voice in choosing the new Tlatuani, summoning the great lords who could make the selection, influencing them and perhaps even imposing their will. For all these reasons, it seems that the role of Siwakoatl involved a man with the same level of power as the Tlatuani. While there was a division of functions between them, they could also have disagreements even sharing leadership roles, in war and performing various duties. It appears that in the time of Tlacaelit, his personality and power stood out excessively. However, after his death, the position took a back seat. And as a result, there is not as much discussion about the subsequent Siwakoatls. While there is mention of others until the fall of Tenochtitlan, the colonial sources emphasize more on the Tlatuanis. Unfortunately, all the information about this position is now seen through the European lens, which prevents us from definitively defining its powers, scope and how it was chosen, to the modern portrayal of it as a hidden power behind the Tlatuani in reality. These were two roles that, based on their vision of duality, share power one alongside the other. This was not only the case among the Mexicas, but also among many other groups of Asian Anahuac. <laughs>